Hi folks, Canadian Prepper here. So everybody wants to know what the hell is going on with the economy right now because there is a huge discrepancy between what is now being termed the real economy versus the hyperinflated stock market. And something just isn't right. What I'm going to talk about today is going to be scary for a lot of people to hear. But I think it's something that we absolutely need to discuss. I think that this is signaling what may possibly be the collapse of the American empire and the US dollar. But that's not all. So stick with me and let's talk about it. I'm going to do my best to try to make this video as cohesive as possible, but I'm probably going to end up going on a lot of tangents and a lot of U-turns and cul-de-sacs. There was this guy named John Glubb. I believe he was a military man. He wrote several essays, and that's all they are. They're just essays. This is not a scientific fact. These are anthropological theories, okay? Now, he theorized that most major empires last around 250 years or 10 generations from the time that they were originated to the time where they collapse, okay? The United States started in 1776, and of course, it is now 2020. That gives us about four years. But there's seven phases of the downfall, and I'll quickly read them to you. There's the pioneer phase. There's the conquest phase. There's the age of commerce and the age of affluence. Then the age of intellect. Then the age of decadence and then the age of decline and collapse. We are somewhere between the age of decadence and collapse. Our culture right now is defined by conspicuous consumption. And that's the name of the game when it comes to our economy. Our economy is all about how can we get people spending. It doesn't matter what we buy. It doesn't matter if people are just flushing money down the toilet and buying things they don't need to impress people they don't like, that whole thing. It's not about innovation anymore. It's not even about intellect. It's just about how much can we consume to keep the economy going. The whole core premise of our economy is stupid at its core. It, it's not intelligent, which is why it's destined to fail at some point down the line. But that's only the beginning. But the gist of John Glubb's argument was that we start off as having to work really hard to establish a good life. So like the pioneers who had to, you know, obviously come to America and, you know, they had to deal with all sorts of uh, challenging situations in order to get established. And I want to say right from the get-go that many people will use this theory to justify imperialism and uh, militarism. That's not what I'm using it for. I'm just trying to take from it the idea that over time, civilizations become more frivolous, they become more decadent, the whole bread and circuses thing, okay? And that's evident in the YouTube trending feed right now because on the one hand, you have the money printing press, which is just revving on all engines right now. We have, of course, this pandemic. Yet, if you go on the YouTube trending page, what do you see? A bunch of mindless distractions, mindless garbage as far as the eye can see. And of course, it's all geared towards the 18 to 35 demographic because those are the people who are most likely to mindlessly consume stuff. Anyways, that's where we are as a culture. It's all about self-indulgence. He also talks about how when a civilization is born, obviously through imperialistic means, there's a more masculine, more patriarchal uh, nature to that civilization. And over time, it becomes more feminized. And of course, you have the state, which starts to take on the role of the father figure, and the father figure is edged out. And, you know, let's not get into that. I've done videos on that before. In fact, there's two videos that I've done that really complement this one. One is the World After 2020 that I made in December of 2019, right before all this stuff happened. And uh, 10 reasons why the uh, collapse of the U.S. empire will be so chaotic. I made that one last March, so go check those out as well. But what we need to acknowledge is that this whole pandemic situation, it's not going to change anything, okay? It's just going to speed up what was already in motion. There were many big changes on the horizon that I talked about in my World After 2020 video, which all of a sudden 
have been given a trial run here. We're talking about things like universal basic income, uh, increasing surveillance, the end of money. And that's a big one that we're really going to talk about. And it's going to be the crux of my thesis here today. And also the world of digital isolation. Everybody separated in their own little cubicles, interacting with each other at a distance and all these things. Now, I'm not saying that this is happening by design. I'm saying that this may well just be the evolutionary uh, trajectory that we're on from which we came. That's the trajectory towards globalism. Ironically, however, and this is the real paradoxical thing, is that we are going to become more globalized because there's going to be more digital and virtual interaction, and yet we're also going to become more isolated because there's going to be less planes flying to and fro, less uh, international travel, that sort of thing. Anyways, moving on. So Warren Buffett, as many people know, if you watch this channel, has recently sold all of his airline stocks at a loss. Okay, so we know that there's a bad forecast for airline stocks from one of the best investors who ever lived. Some people say he's getting old and sea isle, doesn't know what he's talking about, but a lot of people still have faith in what he's saying. And even with this so-called bounce back in the last few days, the airlines were basically at the same level at which he sold them for. So he hasn't lost anything. So, so far, he's still been quite right about that move. Now, he also said in his annual shareholders meeting, one thing he said that I thought about it at the time, but I never really thought too deeply about it. He said that always bet on America. But it was almost like he said it in a way that he was trying to reassure people as if he knew that, you know, what was coming was going to be bad, but that in the end, America would prevail. There was a lot of subtext there that I didn't read into at the time. But in hindsight, it seems as though he anticipates that times are going to be very rough for the United States, which they are especially probably even more so relative to the rest of the world because, of course, the United States is proportionally hit hardest by this, especially when compared to China, which we're going to get into in a bit. But it seemed like he was trying to say that, yeah, things are going to be bad in the short term. And that may be part of the reason why they sold most of their Golden, Goldman Sachs investments in the first quarter of 2020 as well. So we've established so far that our civilization is becoming more decadent and one of the most renowned investors of all time is selling a lot of his uh, holdings in some major, major companies, which is indicative of an impending economic collapse. Now, we know that the Fed is turning the money printers on like there is no tomorrow. And the odd thing about this is th when you think about it, you know, we had all these problems going on in society for so long. I mean, there's infrastructure that needs to be rebuilt, be rebuilt. There's, you know, poverty, all these things. Things that money could definitely help with. I'm not saying just throwing money at the problem is going to solve everything. But all of a sudden, they have the ability to just increase their balance sheets. I think Jerome Powell said that they're going to do it infinitely. You know, if they have to, they're going to just keep printing money to the moon and back. And so you got to kind of scratch your head for a second there and think, well, why, why didn't they just do this before? Because right now it appears that nobody seems to be thinking about how this money is going to be paid back or have any consideration for it. It's almost as if they just don't want people to think about that part of it. Even the stock market's projections, they have all of this future value priced in now up until 2021. Like there's this idea that, Obviously, the stock market is based on, you know, the, the future projections of certain companies and how much money they're going to earn. Well, now they're talking about, oh, the economy is going to be great in 2021. So that's why the stock price is so high. Well, why not just go out to 2022, 2025, 2030? Hell, in 2100, things might be better. So, hey, let's have a bull market rally. Doesn't make too much sense to me. Now, we know that the Fed is backstopping the stock market and that, in part, is what is keeping it all propped up. It appears that so long as the Fed is willing to print money, people are confident enough to keep their money in these stocks and we avoid another sell-off. But any day now, that could change. Now there's two requirements, two things that are necessary 
for the American dollar to actually collapse. There must be, number one, an underlying weakness in the value of the U.S. dollar, which there likely will be if the Fed continues to do what it's doing and the countries of the world who are holding up to $6 trillion in U.S. dollars decide, you know, uh, we're not really too confident in this currency anymore, and I think we're going to look for an alternative. And that is the second thing. There needs to be a viable alternative. Because remember, all the economies of the world right now are taking a hit. So by comparison, the U.S. dollar is still pretty strong. And in fact, it has been fairly strong throughout this whole process. But we are now in the era of cryptocurrencies. Bitcoin has been around, I don't know, probably 10 years now or something like that. And a lot of people are starting to move their money into Bitcoin. Now, Bitcoin is very volatile. Just like all of these cryptocurrencies, they're very volatile. And to a lot of people's dismay, the Bitcoin price throughout this whole pandemic has been incredibly volatile and not as stable as a lot of people would have imagined it would be. It fluctuated with the stock market. So I think that right now, the timing is ripe for some sort of modification to the Bitcoin system or some introduction of a new cryptocurrency that people are going to start to move towards if this money printing business continues. And if that happens, your dollars are going to be worthless. Because if people start abandoning the dollar and you start getting that hyperinflation going on, well, everybody's going to be jumping into Bitcoin or precious metals, or they're going to be putting their money in something. And I think that the infrastructure is already starting to form in order to do that. There's this application made by a company called Square called Cash App. Okay, and for the longest time, you, you had to buy Bitcoin through uh, some of these apps which were separate from your bank account. But what this Square Cash App is trying to do, and the CEO of that, just FYI, is Jack Dorsey, the same guy who owns Twitter. What they're trying to do is make a, a complete banking system where you basically, you get your stimulus check. If you want, you can buy Bitcoin through the app. You can make trades through the app. So it's one app to rule them all. And to be honest, if I was going to invest in a company right now, um, while well, there would be a few of them, there'd be Shopify, which is going to be the next Amazon. There would be Square uh, because of this cash app stuff. And of course, Tesla, uh, even though it's a little overvalued right now, I think that that's definitely the future. Those would be my three big picks, especially Square, because I think that's coming. I think that the this might be the trigger for the collapse of the U.S. dollar. And I'm not sure if this is by design. Obviously, you know, you got to put your tinfoil hat on if you believe that. But one thing is for sure. We are at record unemployment. And there is a talk that 42% of those jobs are not going to come back. So it's not going to be like, oh, they were just furloughed or laid off. A lot of those jobs aren't going to be coming back. The commercial real estate market is going to be in ruins when a lot of companies realize that, hey, we can just get people to work from home. So, yeah, we're just going to be closing down these locations. We can put that money from the rent into something else, and that makes our shareholders happier, and the stock price rises even more. And what I think is happening right now, you know, there's some people who will say, well, we're going to see deflation. Uh, we're going to see inflation. It seems like there's more people thinking that we're going to see inflation, although there is one compelling argument that we're first going to see a protracted period of deflation, but I don't know how much stock I put in that. That really depends on if the stock market liquidates, because if people start selling and all of that money, all of that inflation, which is uh, in the stock market balloon right now, if that deflates and all of that liquidity, I hate those terms, liquidity, quantitative easing, yuck, I hate those words, leveraged, all of these words, you know, that they use to mask the reality of what's going on. But if that happens, if all that money goes into the system and people start spending that money, that's going to cause prices to go up. The supply chain is still struggling to catch up. There's still a bottleneck. There's still places that are shut down or they're at lower productivity. So... <laughs> 
hopefully that doesn't happen. The Fed's saying it's not going to let that happen. But at what point, you know, at what point do countries say, whoa, 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 that's enough? You know, so something is going to happen that is going to be the, the line that the Fed crosses where it, it's just going to reach a breaking point. Nobody knows what that point is going to be. But they're being very quiet about the austerity that is going to be coming at the end of all of this. Once the stimulus checks stop rolling out and once taxes have to get raised and people have to you know, pay back all of that stuff and they have to do government cuts for certain services and all this, that's when people are going to start to go a little batty and they're going to be demanding something else. Now, obviously, they're trying to kick that can down the road as far as they can. And so we're in kind of a catch-22 situation. We're making the crisis worse by not just letting things collapse and letting the chips fall where they may. Instead, we're printing money to try to keep all these zombie corporations to maintain the status quo, the capitalist status quo, if you will. Unfortunately, the longer we do that, the, the worse the crisis is going to be. We're in a position right now where we could just stop doing that and there's going to be another market collapse. Things are going to get corrected to the levels they should be, which is probably in the teens somewhere, if we're talking about the Dow Jones, 17, 18,000 range, I would say. That's probably where it should be. That's fair. Some people would say it should even be lower than that. But because if we don't do that, we're going to be paying for this for decades. Now, a lot of people will say, well, Nate, you're Canadian. Why do you keep saying we? Because Canada is tethered to the sinking ship that is the United States. If you guys go down, we go down too. So that's why we just say we. In fact, I wouldn't be against being annexed by the US just so we can get some of those cool toys that you guys have down there. So we're gonna have a budget deficit in the trillions of dollars, trillions, budget deficit, just the deficit, not the debt. The actual debt is, you know, in the double digit trillions, obviously, but then you add all the, the derivatives and all the liabilities and all that. I think it's something in the quadrillions. It, it's just ridiculous numbers, okay? In order for us to get that money, that's a lot of labor. That's a lot of things that need to be produced to generate money. So you're going to have a drop in GDP of around 30%, I believe they're predicting, which is massive. It's a huge economic contraction. You're going to have an increase in taxes. You're going to have a bunch of people who are pissed off and unemployed because the stock market is still doing great. And all of that money, obviously, I, every time I make a video like this, someone goes into the comment section and they type in that cliche, the greatest transfer of wealth in all human history. Yeah, okay, we get it. <clears throat> it's definitely going to be that. That's definitely what it's going to be. And the middle class is kind of a piece right now because if you have uh, some of these, what are they called, like uh, the mutual funds or if you have like a 401k, it's doing okay right now because the market is back up a little bit. But proportionally, it's the 0.001% who are doing the best out of everybody because they're the ones who hold the majority of the shares in those corporations. So what has to happen then if you have a population which is not replenishing itself, although we may see a post-COVID baby boom, some people are predicting that, who knows, I think people are still largely using contraceptions, so we'll see what happens there. But what happens when your population is not reproducing itself fast enough. You need more taxpayers. That birth certificate that you have is almost like a guarantee that you are going to, the government can use that and they can say, look, we have this guy, he's going to pay X amount of dollars in taxes for the rest of his life. That's what those little tickets are. They're like, birth certificates are like tickets for governments. This guy's going to pay this amount of taxes. Yeah, there might be two out of 10 people that the system has to take care of. But as long as we got eight out of 10 working, paying taxes, then you know the system can still function. But if every two people are only having 1.6 children while the population's going down, you have an aging population. And that's why, of course, you're seeing like in Canada, the retirement age keeps getting pushed back. But at some point, you're gonna have to bring in more taxpayers. So that is the whole reason for the push for immigration. It's not to be, you know, charitable or philanthropic. It's because at some point down the road, 
we need to make more taxpayers. And immigrants tend to have more children. So, yeah, you know, immigrants may come right now and they may require government support. But the idea is that down the line, they're going to have children and those kids are going to pay taxes. See, this is this. I'm guessing this is how governments and economists think, especially with regards to immigration. And that's what a lot of people don't understand. Consider this. If you were to double the population of the United States right now, if you just open the floodgates, let in 300 million people, well, your share of the national debt just got cut in half. So every person that immigrates to the country or every child that is born essentially reduces the portion of the national debt that you have to pay. Now, we also have a lot of tension right now between China and the United States. And China and Japan, in particular, hold a lot of U.S. debt. Not enough to collapse the U.S. economy, necessarily, or you know, even do any huge damage. Because, of course, China does require the U.S. consumer base. You have Tesla building a factory there to sell cars to Chinese people. And these are luxury cars. These are expensive vehicles that only a middle class person can enjoy. So you have one of the largest middle classes, I think it's something like 200 million people who are now in the Chinese middle class who have money to spend. And they also are starting to do things in Africa so that they can sell products to Africa and also probably exploit them for their labor, just like the United States has been exploiting China's labor. You know, that's the one thing with uh, capitalism, which is kind of dirty. It's that in order for us to get all of this cheap stuff, somebody has to be enslaved somewhere. We could have never got Walmarts, uh, Costco's, all of these things if there wasn't a dictatorship in the East who had endless human resources to manufacture all this stuff. And people talk about how we got to bring the manufacturing back to the United States. Well, from an evolutionary standpoint, that's a step back. A service-based economy is a more evolved economy. So if we were to take a step back and bring in more menial jobs, I don't think that that would work too well. And I, in fact, as I've said before, I think that if we do bring manufacturing back, and this is why this is so timely. This is all just coming together. Crypto, automation, artificial intelligence. If the jobs come back, they're going to be done in an automated way. Even the Tesla plants. Yes, they require people to work in them. But there's also revolutionary uh, new machines and automation that are being employed in those factories. Okay, So to think that we're just going to bring back all of these menial jobs... That should really worry you, in fact, because what that means is that we've now been downgraded. So be careful what you wish for when you want the jobs to come back because you just might get it. And of course, what that's going to mean is higher prices. And who's going to want to do the work? Who wants to do the work now? These are serious things that people have to just think about before getting all emotional and you know getting all political. We just got to think about the problems and how we can fix these problems. Obviously, the U.S. is in debt to China. If they choose to cancel that debt in an attempt to recoup some of the losses as a result of this virus, then that's when the tensions are really going to start to build. I did a video last summer, very controversial. It was all about China versus the USA and how I thought that might go down. Another thing for you to consider is that when civilizations are on the brink of collapse, they tend to build walls, like the Great Wall of China. Obviously, the desire to build a wall to Mexico, it's a bit different. It's not because we're worried about an invading army. It's about, you know, keeping people from illegally immigrating. But, you know, it's metaphorically significant, I think. And if you look at all the failed interventions, be that Iraq... Syria, uh, Libya, there was a failed coup recently in Venezuela, and probably countless others. Afghanistan's another one. All of these interventions which have failed support this argument that the U.S. is well beyond the age of imperialism, and we are now you know, past the age of intellect, which might be in the 60s, where people started getting into the New Age stuff, and past the age of 
decadence, which of course is the YouTube, you know, trending feed generation. And now we're entering the age of collapse. And it comes at an interesting point in time because we have the convergence of all these new technologies. Never before in history was there a viable alternative to the US dollar. Now there is. Not in its current form, Bitcoin or whatever the case would have to be modified to make it more stable, to make it uh, less volatile. Something like gold, for instance. So what I'm saying essentially is that right now people measure their Bitcoin in US dollars. But there may come a point where people are measuring their US dollars in some form of crypto. We also have military spending around the world, which is going up. You have the Space Force, Chinese rockets that are dropping stuff over cities. I mean, I'm not saying that that's in any way related to a militaristic intent, but something's going on. Okay, something, they're getting ready for something. There's going to be a flashpoint of activity somewhere as a result of this. And this whole superbug has just expedited what was already in motion because you knew there was going to be a clash of superpowers at some point down the road. There just needed to be a catalyst for that. And that's what the pandemic is being. Now, of course, China would like their currency to be the global reserve currency that you want. And you may have some countries after this which have observed the way China was able to lock down their population in a draconian way. Sorry, I had to use the word one more time before it falls into the annals of history. China had the ability to literally lock down their population and weld people into buildings to arrest the spread of the virus. Now, were they transparent with their numbers? Uh, were they transparent about everything else? Was there evidence that was burned? And yada, yada. I'm not going to get into that. But what I'm saying is that a lot of people may look at that and say, well, they were able to get it under control. But what happened in the land of the free? You know, there was political divisiveness every day, you know, that there was no cohesiveness. And remember that there are hackers out there, not even necessarily hackers. There are groups of people who go on the internet and instigate to create division within society. This is a proven fact. And it leads to an increasingly polarized society, which is not unified. And other countries look at that and they're going to start to lack faith in the US dollar because it seems like right now it's just a political one up game. Oh, you, you want to print three trillion? Well, we're going to print five trillion, you know? And it's really all about politics at this point. It's not about resolving the problems. It's about grandstanding. It's about who can look the best at the end of all this and get the votes. And even the notion, I was reading something the other day that Trump actually wants a weaker dollar so that they can start exporting again. And this goes back to the whole idea that to, to be a manufacturing-based society, as resilient as that might make us, it's really a step back because you're talking about going into more, getting your population into more menial jobs which are less ed educated or which require less education. I'm not knocking those jobs or the people that do them at all. I'm just saying that at the end of the day, you're talking about lower paying jobs, that you're wanting to bring that back so that you can become an exporting country and have a weaker dollar so that people are willing to buy your goods. It just, it seems kind of backwards. I just don't think that that's the right way to go. I think we should be looking beyond that. But maybe this whole crypto is going to come in and surprise people. There's going to be something that gets brought in. There's going to be some, I don't know. I know somebody somewhere is working on something. <laughs> Sorry to leave you guys with such a open-ended, ambiguous uh, conclusion. But that's where it seems that this is headed because just remember at any moment now, the market could crash. Like it could just crash. Like it just went up a thousand points and they say it was because of some promising vaccine. And I knew that tomorrow, I, th I had this thought, I bet you tomorrow they're going to come out and say, oh, actually we jumped the gun. You know, the, the results weren't as great as we thought they were. And sure enough, it did. And the market went down. 
not as much as it went up because of course there was also other stuff with the the fed printing money and all that and the three trillion proposed by pelosi and all that stuff but it just goes to show that this market is so volatile right now and it's reached a resistance level like if you look at uh, the major indices, not the NASDAQ, but the Dow certainly has reached a uh, resistance level. It seems around the 24 range. It's very hard for them to push it beyond that. But you know what? Nothing would surprise me at this point. But I would be very wary of those numbers because they're inflated. That's where the inflation in the currency, that's where the fake money is hiding. That were that money to go into the system, your dollars would be worth significantly less significantly less and then we have this whole operation warp speed thing the whole vaccine thing and that is going to cause oscillations in the market all the way up to the end of the year because every time you know the market's going to go up because oh we got a treatment we got a vaccine oh it didn't work so the market's going to go down and we're going to do that whole dance to the end of the year if it even comes about and then of course we have the numbers which are going up again they were going down. Actually, they were below. There was one day where there was less than 1,000 deaths in the United States. They were going down. But now it seems like they are starting to go up again. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens in the next couple weeks. Because everybody's out there. They're doing the thing. People are complacent once again. We're going to have to see what happens. I don't think... We're going to shut it down again. I don't think people are going to go for that. I think there's going to be too much resistance to that idea. I think now it's just going to be social distancing and, you know, every man for himself. It's certainly a virus that I still don't want to catch, no matter what people are saying that, oh, only 1% die from it and all this. There's still a lot we don't know about it. There was a guy on Joe Rogan, and I know this is anecdotal, but... He was a young, healthy guy, and he had it, and he said he almost died as a result of it. And one of the doctors had told him that they were actually undercounting the deaths because there were certain uh, dual complications which weren't being recorded as, as uh, superbug deaths. So I don't know, man. I just don't get, don't get too cocky with that because it's not a problem until either you have it or someone you know has it and has to go to the hospital, then it's a problem. So this is something you still don't want to get. Yes, I believe that some of the response appears to be exaggerated, almost to the point of detrimental. And this is where you could screw that tinfoil hat on tight and say, well, maybe the plan all along was to collapse the US dollar and bring in a new cryptocurrency. You know, I could have probably just said that at the beginning of the video and people would have walked away and been like, yeah, that's the truth. But I don't want to do that because there's nuance to everything, right? There's, there's so much to take in here. I've literally been racking my brain from dusk till dawn for the last two weeks to try to figure out what the f*** is going on. I've listened to every possible financial advisor and economist trying to get something tangible. And when you watch those videos, especially the ones with the guys who say, I'm not a financial advisor, but here's 20 minutes of financial advice. I find that I walk away from those videos knowing less. Not that they don't know what they're talking about. It's just that for legal reasons, they have to be so ambiguous. So they're not liable for any stupid decisions people might make on the basis of their advice. So you really walk away knowing less. But that's part of the reason why I made this video is because I know that there's going to be some guy who has all the answers in the comment section and he's going to post it in bold letters. So look out for that guy because he has all the answers. And all I can say is that one of these days, that guy, Peter Schiff, he's going to be right. He's going to be right, folks. A broken clock, just like AJ, a broken clock is right twice a day. And everything that Peter Schiff says makes perfect sense. It's just that Obviously, there's the whole gold thing he's pushing at the same time, which I don't think the end game here is gold. I think the end game is crypto or some form of global digital currency. It's, it's not going to be gold. I know a lot of people want it to be, but I don't think it's going to be. Yes, gold will always have some kinds of 
quote unquote intrinsic value. There's dual meanings to that term when it comes to gold. I don't think that's going to be the phoenix that rises from the ashes of all of this. I think that we are on the precipice of a truly new world arrangement. It's written on the dollar bill. Anyways, guys, let me know what you think in the comment section. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. Thanks for watching Canadian Prepper O. The best way to support this channel is to support yourself by gearing up at CanadianPreparedness.com. Your one-stop shop for premium, high-quality, brand-name products that have been tried and tested by myself and other YouTube gear reviewers. My subscribers save 10% off by using the coupon code SURVIVALPREPPER. All one word in all caps.